All right. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit about benchmarking your fleet. Um, and this presentation in particular is going to start out a little bit high level. I want to frame for you guys a problem that we see with kind of the traditional benchmarking. I'll talk loud, so hopefully it's over whatever construction is going on next door. Um, so we're going to frame that problem. I'm going to try and paint a picture for you guys as one of the challenges we see in benchmarking. And then Javid's going to actually dive pretty deep. He's going to talk a little bit about machine learning and what we're doing around that. And I'm going to do my best to kind of bring that back and address and show how we're addressing our benchmarking problem and how we're being a little bit smarter about benchmarking uh, via the amazing work that Javid and his team are doing. So to start out, we're going to talk about two neighborhood companies, uh, Yummy Apple Pies and Orange Print Shop. And they don't really exist. They're not real Geotab customers, at least to the best of my knowledge. But um, they sound like cool companies. Yummy Apple Pies can do ready-to-bake pies in 60 minutes or free. So it's a nice little neighborhood shop. It bakes you a fresh apple pie and delivers it to your door in 60 minutes or free. Um, so it's, it's really high, high velocity trips, on-demand delivery. And their neighboring company is a, is a place called Orange Print Shop. And Orange Print Shop does same-day print and delivery to a consumer. So you send them an email or you send an order on their website, and they drop it off. Just like, just like Yummy Apple Pies is dropping it to your house, they're dropping it off to some local business right at their door. Again, it's drop and go, high velocity. Um, and you know these two guys are operating side by side. And both of them have a, a question. Um, they want to reduce their idling. They want to, they're fuel conscious. And, and, but what they're, they're struggling with is, you know, what's a good benchmark for their idling? What do they need to consider to be smart about how they would benchmark their idling? Um, and you know, I, I think the first thought we had along this line a while ago now was, you know, it seems like everybody uses an industry standard. So what would be the industry standard benchmark? for yummy apple pies and orange print shop. Because as everyone knows, you need to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Um, so one of the problems here that we can see is if we classify yummy apple pies as bread and bakery product manufacturing, um, there are other retail bakeries, but they may also be lumped in with packaged baked goods and cereal companies. Now, I've never ordered cereal direct to door. I have Amazon Prime, and it comes pretty quick, but it's not 30 minutes or free. So the typical delivery for those companies is going to be very, very different than what we see with yummy apple pies. Their driving behavior is quite different. In orange print shops, similarly, they would be business service centers. And that's a pretty broad topic, a pretty broad industry. Um, one of the ones that stands out to me that would be pretty different is office product rentals and sales. And I would imagine they would have a very different driving pattern, probably different vehicles that are bringing a photocopy machine as opposed to a set of photocopies uh, out to a business. And chances are, the business owner is not going to be too happy if the photocopier is sitting at the bottom of the stairs and they need to bring it upstairs just like they would with their printing. So again, we have a bit of a problem. The industry is a little bit fuzzy. So the question is, are we actually allowed to compare apples and oranges here? Um, because if we think about these two fleets, they're both on demand. They both get a call or get an email or get an order and they go. They don't know where they're going ahead of time. They just go. They're high trip velocity. Obviously, they're servicing some sort of local area because 60 minutes are free. You can only go so far. And at this time of day in Toronto, it would have to be pretty close to the Harbor Castle if you were going to get there in 60 minutes. Um, so it's drop and go. So it's basically what we would call a hub and spoke delivery pattern. So our thought at Geotab was there's got to be a better way to look at this in industry. Maybe, you know, to put it simply, we don't care what's in the box. We just care that you're dropping off a box. And to make it even more complicated, Let's just say that our, our yummy apple pie business takes off. It's a local success, and it gets some good publicity. It's on Twitter. And the next thing you know, people want their frozen pies all over the United States. And so now they have, they have a mixed fleet. They got the same delivery that they were doing before, the high velocity stuff. Uh, but now they're delivering frozen pies to maybe it's a known set of stores, a certain grocery chain. And that's a very different problem. Um, they're not trying to optimize the time to serve. They should be optimizing their route. Uh, they should be planning their route ahead of time. They should know where they're going. And so those are very, very different driving behaviors. And so it's, it's kind of almost hard to give one benchmark to their entire fleet as it grows. And so this is just our attempt here at painting a picture. And, and the point here is that the same industry doesn't guarantee the same driving pattern. And in fact, neither does the same fleet. It doesn't guarantee the same real, maybe industry even. Um, so we, we kind of have this blurry picture where you might be 90% hub and spoke, 10% uh, distribution center, uh, you might be going direct, long drive, you might have a little bit of everything. And so it's a, it's a pretty complicated problem, but our theory here was that how you drive impacts your idling more than what you drive. And so the way we've been handling this 
and Javid's going to explain it now, is, is through something we've done that we call vehicle vocation. So I'll pass it to Javid and he can explain the work we're doing on vehicle vocation. All right. Hi. Um, so uh, let me explain what vehicle vocation is. Um, this yeah, or you can even use the clicker to the right and left. Yeah. This one? To the right and left. Yeah. All right. Um, so basically, vehicle vocation identifies your vehicle based on your driving pattern. So if two vehicles have the same driving pattern, we group them together. If they have different driving pattern, they would belong to different groups. Uh, we use machine learning algorithm to do this grouping. But before I dive into machine learning, uh, let me explain what driving pattern actually is and what data we actually use to define driving pattern. So the first kind of data that we use is basically when you drive. Um, so for example, what day of the week you drive and what hour, hour, uh, uh, hour of the day you actually drive. The next set of uh, data that is important is basically the duration. How much you idle or uh, you know, how long you drive and how long you stop or park your vehicle. The third set of data that, is, that we use to define di driving pattern is the distance. Uh, basically, how long you drive or how far you drive. We use both point to point and uh, basically the direct distance. And what is your active area? What is the size of the active area the vehicle uh, is active? And the third thing that we use is basically to and from pattern. This identifies either hub and spoke or door to door pattern. So let me, so these are the data sources that we use and from them we actually define machine learning features from them. Um, so let me explain how actually a driving pattern looks like visually. So if you look at this heat map, so this is a heat map. On the x axis I have the hour of the day which the vehicle is active. On the y-axis, I have the day of the week. So I'm missing the weekends, which is uh, 0 and 6, so Saturday and Sunday. And if you look at this heat map, basically if you see a darker color, like here, it means that the vehicle is more active. If you see a lighter color, like this one, or no color, it means that the vehicle is not that active in that hour of that day. So if you look at an office worker, when they are, when they are actually active, you see that it's mostly between uh, 7 to 8 a.m. in the morning, and also in the evening, maybe 4 to 5, 5 p.m. or 5 to 6 p.m. And you, if you see in the middle, there's a line over here, which is around 12 p.m., which is lunch break, right? So this vehicle is actually used during lunch break mostly in the morning and sometimes mostly in the evening and sometimes at night you see some night time driving. So this is the pattern, driving pattern uh, and we are only seeing the time of the day of an office worker or an office vehicle. If you look at a school bus, how does the pattern look like for a school bus? If you look here, again we are looking at the same heat map and the scale is actually the same. Here, but if you look over here, school bus is actually active, um, you know, three hours in the morning, mostly from six to nine in the morning, and in the afternoon, like between maybe one to three p.m. in the afternoon. That's basically the driving pattern of a school bus. If you look here, there is no lunch break in the middle. Also, you don't see any night activity like the office worker over here. Let's compare that with the driving pattern of a delivery or a service vehicle, how that looks like. If you look over here, uh, a delivery vehicle is active from 9 to 5 all throughout the week. There's no lunch break in the middle and there's also not much driving at night. So these are the patterns that we have identified based on time of the day. There are more patterns based on time of the day. We can use other features. There are also other features that are important. So let me, so I have illustrated three patterns over here, three distinct patterns, and they identify three distinct vocations, which is office worker, school, and delivery or service vehicle. Now, how can we actually identify these patterns from our data? 
what is the best way to do that? So what we can do is we can use basic traditional programming, which is basically rule-based programming. Let me simplify the problem. Instead of driving pattern, let's assume we have 10,000 images of cat and 10,000 images of dog. And we want to write a program that can separate you know, cat images from dog images. Uh, how can we actually solve that? W one way to solve that is we can write a lot of rules for identifying a cat. For example, cat has whiskers, it has gray eyes, pointy ears. We can do the same thing for dog. We can write these if-else statement and write a program. But there are a lot of variations of cat and a lot of variations of dog. So we need to write a lot of rules, actually. And basically, the problem soon becomes intractable. You know, you cannot write all these rules. And if you miss some rules, your program will not be accurate. And it won't accurately uh, predict cat and dog. So what is the other approach that we can actually take? We know machine learning algorithms are really good in identifying patterns. So what we can do is basically instead of writing the rules, we can give label instances of cat and label instances of dog. So someone has to label these 10,000 images of cat, 10,000 images of dog. We give that labels, also the images. The machine learning algorithm will actually figure out what is the best rule to actually separate them out. And once we have that, basically, all those rules are saved in a model, machine learning model. We can use that model to actually predict images of cat and images of dog. So basically, machine learning mimics our decision that are embedded in this label. So we still have a problem here. The problem is we need 10,000 label images of cat and 10,000 label images of dog. So basically, we have reduced the problem of writing rules to problem of labeling images or labeling patterns. So how can we do this? In the absence of machine learning label data, this is one approach to actually solve the problem. What we do is we create a lot of visualizations, like the visualizations of time of the day that I have shown you. We show these images or these heat maps to the expert. The expert knows what vocation that vehicle would belong based on the heat map. We collect all this feedback, and we use this feedback to train a model. Once we have that model, we do the prediction. We tried this approach using one of our Geotab employees was doing this. He spent one month to label 10,000 images. Um, and still, the model was not very accurate. Uh, so this approach was not scalable. So what we tried is we tried semi-supervised learning. So what we do is we use the prediction to actually create the visualization. We only show the, the patterns that are important to increase the prediction of the model. And we only show that to the expert. We didn't show any random, random patterns. And that kind of redu reduced the number of iterations we actually need to go over. And basically, we reduced <coughs> down. Maybe in one day, you would be able to label 10,000 images instead of one month. So I have showed you uh, what is the process of labeling the uh, patterns, driving patterns. We, I haven't told you what vocations we are actually targeting. So these are the actual vocations that we are actually targeting. The first set is hub and spoke vehicles. So these vehicles are trying to optimize time to serve. You have a hub location, and basically these vehicles serve their customers from their hub. And we have two subclasses for hub and spoke. One is hub and spoke long stop, hub and spoke quick stop. In total, we have 15 classes. And basically not, uh, I'll go over some of the important ones. So we have hub and spoke. We have local school transport. Uh, there are some long stops. So these vehicles are mostly service vehicles. They stop for a long time in their customer location. And we have three subcategories based on the time of the day, 
which this vehicle is actually active, like daytime, nighttime, and 24 hour. We also have uh, long distance or long haul vehicles, and so on, all these ones. If you want to, want to know more about this hierarchy, you can come to our uh, benchmarking fleet booth, and we can actually explain what each class is actually mean. <coughs> now, in each of these classes, some of the features are important. For example, if you look at the hub and spoke uh, class, quick stop hub and spoke, the hub and spoke uh, feature is very important for that. And short stop means this vehicle short, um, you know, park for a really short time. Good examples of uh, this class is pizza delivery vehicles, usually they follow the hub and spoke pattern, and they don't stop much in their customer location. Uh, we also have hub and spoke long stop. Good example is on-site repair vehicles. They stop more than pizza delivery in, in their customer location. We also have long distance, 24-hour long distance uh, vehicles. They travel really long distances, so the hub and spoke and how long they park are not that important to identify long distance vehicles. Uh, most of them oper operates in 24 hours and in a very large area. Uh, we also have, so not everything is covered by this 15 class, and we have a problem with a mixed vocation. So these are the vehicles that fall in between two vocations, or they have both of these vocations uh, in, the, in their feature. Let me illustrate that problem. So again, I'm going back to the image example. So if you give this to a machine learning algorithm, it will say it's 98% zebra, 2% donkey. So I'm classifying <laughs> zebra and donkey. But there's some uh, things in the background. That's why it's 98% zebra and not 100% zebra. And we all know that's a donkey. It's 1% zebra and 99% donkey, right? There's a lot of zebra population and a lot of uh, donkey population out there. So it's easy to get, uh, you know, images of zebra and images of donkey. Now, if you look at this, this is 60% zebra, 40% donkey. So basically, it's a donkey. And there's not much donkey population. So it's hard to train a model to identify uh, these vehicles. So we face the same problem. We have mixed vocation. We don't have enough examples of these, uh, of these vehicles, right, of these vocations. So we cannot train a model, but in future, we hope we'll, this population will grow and we'll be able to add that in our hierarchy. So some of you might, might not see your expected vocation in our hierarchy, yes. But these things will improve. So these are the future plans that we have. So basically, we have uh, all the building blocks that we need to actually uh, predict vehicle vocation. Uh, and over time, this uh, model will only uh, will get more accurate over time. Just like other machine learning models, this will also get accurate over time. Uh, we'll actually develop new classifications. <coughs> uh, we'll add new driving patterns. And also, we'd like to give recommendation in future based on driving pattern. Thank you. Thanks, And Jerry. Bob will now explain how vehicle vocation is used to do idling benchmarks. Right. So if we now to, I know that you're all sufficiently getting your head wrapped around machine learning. Uh, but to bring it back to our problem at hand with our two fake stores, um, we're trying to be smart about benchmarking. Um, and so our theory was that you know we can't go by industry. We need to do something on driving pattern and driving behavior. Um, a single fleet even poses an issue if they had different driving behaviors. Um, so back to the question at hand, how can we help decide what a benchmark idling percentage should be for each company? Um, and we need the right insight to make this decision. We need to know which factors actually contribute to idling. Um, one approach we could have taken, because we have so much data in our big data repository, was to say, hey, we'll just give you everyone in your area, and you can get a benchmark, an idling benchmark, uh, because it must depend on what city you're in. Um, but does it depend on what city you're in? We're not sure. Um, so the most important question, though, was what are the key factors that, import, uh, that impact idling? Um, and 
you know, I really hope that vocation is one of those, and we'll show that in a second. Um, so is it weather? Is it the city size? Is it the type of driving you do? Um, our goal is to answer these questions, and uh, the way we're going to do this is we're actually going to do the research as much as we can on our side. So the first benchmark we're starting with is idling, in fact. Um, so we have a team of data scientists uh, that work with Javid um, to actually go through our data and try and uncover what it is that impacts idling, what matters, and just as important to that, what doesn't matter when you're trying to figure out a benchmark for idling? Um, so again, the most important question, because we spent a lot of resources and learning on machine learning, is does vehicle vocation impact idling? And I think you guys can figure out that we wouldn't be standing here and talking to you if the answer was no. So the answer is yes. Um, and we can take a look at that. And I know this chart is probably hard to see from the back of the room and probably you know, a little bit difficult to read here. But the, the gist of it is that these are our 15 different vocations today. And every single one of these looks a little bit different. So some vocations do have very similar idling patterns on this box chart, and some of them don't. You can see the average is quite different across vocations, and the spread is quite different. So it certainly stands to reason that this impacts idling, and this is something we should consider when delivering an idling benchmark. Um, so let's see what else we, we've uncovered, and let's see what else plays a role. Well, it turns out time of day plays a pretty big role in idling as well. So we've done some research, we've sliced by our vocation, and now we've seen, taking into consideration vocation, which in and of itself, as Javid mentioned, has some time of day component. Does time of day still matter when you're talking about idling and you're looking at uh, by vocation? And you can see a clear trend here. Again, it's not important what the numbers are from the back of the room, but it's very, very clear that in the early hours of the morning and late at night, we see an increase in idling across all of our vocations. Uh, these are the top six vocations. So time of day is something that you should be considering when you're doing your idling benchmarks. And the other one, again, this is no surprise, and this still holds true across all of our different um, vocations, is temperature. And anyone who lives anywhere near here in the middle of the winter knows that it's pretty hard to get into a cold car and go off to work or go off and do your job. So no surprise that we see a huge peak here in the very, very cold temperatures. But another, one thing that was surprising to me, and I guess people are cooling their cars, is that as we start to creep out into the really high temperatures, we start to see another change in idling as well. Um, so there are definitely three things that you need to consider so far when you're looking at your idling. And one of the other surprises that I found was I, I had figured that city size or population would play a pretty significant role. Um, and actually, from what we found, once we considered the time of day and the temperature and the vocation, and we created a statistical model, the results were that it really doesn't matter what size city you're in, in terms of an idling benchmark. Now this may matter a whole lot on some other benchmark, but based on what we can tell, it doesn't matter uh, for idling. And so if you have a fleet that operates in a city and you have a part of your fleet that operates in the country, you can set the same MyGeoTab rule for idling and expect that they should both be within you know, a certain percent, one or two percent idling. Um, and that's pretty powerful just to know that in and of itself. Um, so to showcase what we've learned, we're going to be publishing white papers which every, with every one of our benchmarks. And the first one is almost done. It'll be out soon, and you'll be able to dig through the white paper and see exactly what we did and how we did our analysis. Um, and if you have any feedback or think there's something we missed, that would be great because you know, we obviously want these things to be as accurate as possible. Um, another thing that we're going to be doing for benchmarking is we're going to be adding something into my geotab um, called the Fleet Industry Trend Report. And what this is is a report that will generate monthly, uh, and it contains insights from our 1.2 million vehicles. Uh, so starting out, the, results are, the charts are going to be pretty high level, but the idea is that we want to put some charts in here that will help you either ask questions about your own per fleets or your customer's fleets, or maybe answer some questions that you've always had. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that we're going to highlight is the composition of different fleets. Uh, so what is the average age of a vehicle in our database? It turns out it's 5.3 years. Uh, we'll show you the distribution across different databases so you can see how you stack up and the composition by vehicle type. We're also going to have those idling trends that we've talked about. So we're going to showcase for you the charts that will help you understand what matters and what doesn't matter when you're setting idling rules in your database. Uh, again, like I said, this research is almost done and almost wrapped up and published, so we'll be able to put these charts in there as well. There will be a section on fuel economy, 
Uh, so what you see here is a distribution of fuel consumption by engine size. Uh, you can't see it at the bottom there, but there's you know distribution by truck class. And we actually slice out our most popular vehicles and show you what we see on those as well. Um, so akin to what Neil was talking about this morning, if you saw it, we'll show you what we see from our you know top, I think it's 10 vehicles or 15 vehicles. And finally, there's going to be a safety section as well. And this will highlight particular areas. I think we're at the state province level there right now to show you what a good number is in that area um, and also what the breakdown of different um, incidents are that we see. Now each one of these sections may deserve its own benchmark and may deserve its own research and we'll get there but we thought that this would be information that would be powerful to put in your hands uh, today and so we're, we're going to roll that out shortly. It's uh, just in its final testing at, at, in the office in our database and you should see this uh, soon as it rolls out over the next few months. Um, there's also going to be a new column in the MyGeotab reports and we'll provide some more information on how this will work um, but basically this new column is going to show you our predicted vocation uh, from the work that Javid just described. Uh, so since some of our charts show you what the idling might be by vocation it would be nice if you could actually see what we see in your data. Um, and you know we may not get everything right there may be some zonkeys as Javid said um, we, we may have to tune our algorithm over time but we think now's the time to start rolling this out and start getting feedback um, so over the next few months we're going to be working with the my geotab team I've already seen a demo of this internally uh, and with a few key reports we'll be able to give you what we see on your vehicles uh, now a couple caveats uh, the predictions will be done monthly so we roll every every month we do a prediction and they do require three months of data so that we can get the level of resolution that we need to be able to figure out what vocation we think you are but this actually is, is pretty useful so it's not only a new way to group your data so um, you know you can group your reports by this and take averages but anyone who made the walk like I did from the data visualization talk to here would realize that if we're exposing this in my geotab reports this is also exposed in the new dashboarding framework we're working on so you'll be able to slice and dice your data by vocation as well and even just the vocation results themselves can tell you an awful lot um, so if we think about that yummy apple pie company they would expect some sort of split of some of their vehicles being hub and spoke and some of their vehicles being routed um, but what is that split and they would be able to look through their vocation and see what we're identifying as hub and spoke see what we're identifying as routed and see if that lines up with their impression of the businesses um, a shift from one to the other could show vehicles transitioning from one role to another and even just unexpected classifications um, could highlight misused vehicles or maybe the wrong vehicle for the wrong purpose if you have a heavy duty vehicle out there running hub and spoke deliveries I mean that's probably not the best use case for that vehicle uh, so just on their own I think they're useful but as we start tying these things into benchmarks uh, they'll be all that much more useful so in summary I tried to bring the ML stuff back into the benchmarking um, we want to bring the power of big data into my geotab and the first few ways we're teasing that in are through the vocations in the reports and our monthly trend report um, we're continuing to do research in different benchmarks uh, trying to figure out what the next one to tackle is, what the research should be, revisiting the research we've done. We want to expand the functionality of the monthly trend report over time. Keep in mind this is a first release. Uh, what we want to do is get this out there so you can look at it and ask some good questions about your fleets. But we'd love to be able to provide better tools for you to kind of compare one to one and overlay your own fleet with that data that we're providing from our 1.2 million vehicles. So those are things we're considering uh, working on in the short term. And then, of course, um, we, we're doing continued machine learning in a bunch of different areas, and I'm happy to chat about that downstairs on the floor. Uh, but this particular uh, model that we're creating on vocation is now a living, breathing entity. And so it'll get smarter over time, just like I did when I learned what Javid was doing. And uh, it'll learn more things, and we'll <laughs> discover more types of vehicles. And you know, at some point in the future, we may try to figure out a good way to reach out and get some feedback, because we have an awful lot of experts in the room right now and the more experts that can give information to this model the smarter it can be so those are the plans around benchmarking hopefully we kind of the journey wasn't a, went pretty smooth there from from a problem statement to machine learning to what we've discovered and uh, if anyone has any questions just let me know I guess I'll check the ones up here as well yeah um, are we planning to add that Um, first pass is going to be in reports um, and then um, yeah I'm not sure over time I, I don't see why we couldn't uh, add it to the SDK uh, but we haven't thought about that yet that's a good question 
Um, and I think what you'll find, uh, we're being somewhat lenient, to be honest. Um, uh, like, like Javid said, this, this thing kind of needs to learn. And so we're not going to nail every single vehicle. And we'd rather spend the time getting the ones right and then explaining that you're, I guess, for lack of a better term, one of the zonkeys there. And, uh, and so we're being very, very, uh, we only are showing very confident predictions, I guess I'll say. Yep. Yeah, um, and th those vehicles are causing uh, are causing not issues but surprises in other areas of machine learning as well. So I, I guess EVs and uh, um, vehicles that uh, uh, shut off, um, I mean, really aren't idling um, and may not benefit much from this. Uh, but some of the things we might want to optimize for in the future is um, stop times. Uh, so if you think about the two hub and spoke examples, there's, there's got to be some sort of benchmark optimal stop time if you're a high velocity in and out hub and spoke vehicle. Um, so regardless of whether your car is running or not, if that's something you're looking to optimize, then that's something that we could provide a benchmark for. And regardless of the type of fuel or the type of engine, how long you stop at a customer, if you want it to be short or maybe you're billing by the hour and you want it to be long, those are the types of things that might be interesting. Um, another one that comes up that's pretty interesting that is again across all vehicles is utilization. So if we know the type of driving that you're doing, can we come up with a way to score your utilization so that you can more easily find your over and underutilized vehicles? Um, we don't really have a lot of office workers, even though our example was office workers, it's easy to understand, but one could argue that if you drive a vehicle to work and to home as an office worker, that's 100% utilized. And that's very, very different than what you should be doing with a service vehicle. Um, so to answer your question, I guess in a roundabout way, I guess those things would uh, pose an issue, um, but if the engine goes off, we wouldn't be counting those towards idling in the benchmark. Um, but they could be those zonkeys that you're talking about that they're a little bit different. We. Yeah. Sits at the rack waiting to get loaded, so it's idle just as a course of business. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so we have. Sorry. We have a couple of, um, of vehicles that we expect to have high idling. So we have vehicles that, as you write, as a course of business, they need to operate their vehicle. They need that engine running. Uh, so they are actually a classification that we have. Uh, and that maybe requires a better hierarchy. But right now, we have looked for those vehicles that it appears as a course of business need to run. No, we need enough How do you eggs. benchmark that? Well, yeah. So you, you want this one, Javier? You look like yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> like uh, the problem is, uh, if you have enough vehicles of this type, we would be able to put that class in the machine learning, and it will figure out a way to learn and identify these vehicles. But if you have like maybe hundred of vehicles, that's not enough for the machine learning algorithm to I've learn got from that. So that's more than hundred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk about getting some labels. Um, there is one question from online, so I'll handle that next. So, is time of year, summer versus winter, a major idling benchmark that was considered? Um, so you'll see in the white paper, seasonality was considered. Um, but in the statistical model, at least the last time I read the, the, the draft of the white paper, um, the way they sliced it, they looked at it from, from a seasonality perspective, but they also looked at it from a temperature perspective. And what we found was that it's more a function of temperature and the seasonality. Uh, you know, seasonality certainly affects idling here, but in places where the temperature was, was less varying, it didn't. So it, it's, we believe it's more a function of the temperature than it is, than it is the, um, the season. Uh, right now, it's just a report. Okay. It's, you know, it's one of those things that we could hold it back and, and wait until we get it perfect. But at this point, I think there is some valuable information in there for you to see uh, and to see what we see. The goal is to provide easier ways for you to compare against your own or your customer's fleets. Um, so the goal is to expand on it. But uh, at this point in time, I think even the statistics themselves are generally interesting. And uh, why not get them out there for everyone to see?
related to the last question, that's probably the biggest thing we run into. It's, okay, well, fine, I've analyzed my case this way and that way, but how do I compare? But then that fraught with danger because who's to say that what you're comparing to and the fact that you knew Um, yeah, and so if I understand you correctly, I mean, one of the, one of the things that we're exploring, um, and hopefully this helps answer the question, um, one of the things that we're exploring is the ability to then, once we've locked in what we, we feel affects a benchmark and what the research shows affects a benchmark, um, and say it's something like temperature, like I said, time of day, and your vocation, um, as the model gets better and as we predict more vehicles, we have the vocation. Everyone knows we know what time you're driving because you're driving around and you have a GPS and, and it has a, a clock. Um, but what, is, what else is interesting is that we almost have enough vehicles now, especially in North America, to get roadside temperature uh, on aggregate from our 1.2 million vehicles um, and clean that data and filter out outliers. So there is the potential at, at, at some point here in the, in the near future that we would be able to use those three key pieces of information to deliver a personalized benchmark for every vehicle. So if I wake up in the morning and it's freezing cold and I'm out, I'm out doing my job, um, and then in the afternoon there's a big temperature swing and it warms up, and again, I'm still driving around, I may have a very, very different uh, personal benchmark than Javed if he slept in that day and only drove in the afternoon, even if we do the same thing. Uh, so these are all things that we're, we're hoping to explore. Um, but rather than wait until we get to that level of detail, you know, we're starting with, with these few steps. But you're absolutely right. Like, I, I think um, some sort of personalized way of managing it and finding the guys, um, the, the drivers or the vehicles that are outside the realm of what we think is acceptable and by how far, I think managing by those exceptions would be, would be key, if that answers your question at all. Anyone else? Pretty good on time. All right, if there's nothing else, then I am on the floor for the rest of the day and tomorrow, and so is Javid. We have a few booths out there. Um, don't forget the code, which I conveniently took down here. Sorry. 2902. Um, come find us if you want to chat. We're happy to, more than happy to chat your ear off about data and big data and all those other things. Thanks. Thank you.